I was in the hotel lobby and all of a sudden in the hotel, somebody picks me up from behind and lifts me in the air. And I'm saying, put me down. And I turn around and it's LeGarrette Blunt, who wow. I had actually become very friendly with. With all that, that toughness that he exudes, he was one of the nicest, warmest people I've ever met. And he looks at my ring, which I'm proudly wearing, and it was the 2004 NFC Championship ring. Right, right. And I'm, I'm, and he said, let me look at that ring. And he said, that is a loser's ring. Oh. I said, it's all I have. <laughs> he, said, he said, we're going to get you a real ring tomorrow. Wow. wow. I promise you're going to get a real ring tomorrow. You know, oh my goodness, totally bro! The first time, the first time we started. Oh, Marrow. there he is, Meryl. Can you hear us now? We I've got you, Meryl. I hear you. <laughs> so Barrett was just saying, Meryl. And, 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 and first of all, great, great to have you on the show, man. Welcome. Great to, to be with State. you guys. Yeah. Three of my favorite people. Oh, big, and, big. Same back at you, a hundred percent. And Barrett just said when he was just starting out in the business after his playing career, he was doing some stuff on the radio, and he said that you heard it and you went to him and said, "Listen." You can do this on TV, and that went a long way for him to him to have that kind of belief in himself to, to where he is today. So you're to blame, Merrill, for, for us having to deal with Barrett all, all day long. <laughs> also, I'm also also to blame for Barrett getting a wife. Oh, yes, that's right. Whoa, what? we get it. What? What? <laughs> the first date I went on with Sanji, I bring her, right? And, I, and I'm up there, and I'm doing radio on Merrill's show. And he said, that's a beautiful young lady over there. I said, yeah. You know, he said, is, is, that, your, is that your wife? I said, no. I mess, that's, you know, just a friend of mine. He said, you better make him make her your wife. He told, <laughs> and then he told my wife that. <laughs> and then I saw, then, then, you know, long story long, I went and played in the NFL. And he would always speak to her. And then I see him when I'm in Pittsburgh. Now, we're talking about 10 years later. And I walk by and I look and he and we're walking through and he's at Pittsburgh doing the doing the game. Mm -hmm. And Sanji's walking next to me. I'm walking to the Wise Lounge. And lo and behold, see, I told you you should have married her. <laughs> <laughs> All these years later. I say, Meryl, you are my guy. See? <laughs> <laughs> Who knew he's a matchmaker on top of That's everyone it. else he does? <laughs> it's unbelievable. Meryl, you do it all, man. It's it's just unbelievable. It's That's a it. nice little hey, side man. gig for you. That's hey, it. Meryl, Meryl, um, you, as you told me earlier today, you are entering your 46th season yeah. as the play-by-play -play guy for the Eagles. When you started out on this journey, did you have a long-range goal, or did you just take it year to year knowing that we could be here today and gone tomorrow the next day in this business? No, my, my long-range goal, um, well, it, people say it's your dream job. My dream job when I was a little kid was to be the quarterback of the Eagles. But see, see, at 5'8 and 140 pounds, there wasn't much of that. But uh, when I got into this, which was as a kid, I did television commercials. I had one of these show business mothers. I did a lot of that stuff. But once I realized I wasn't going to be a professional athlete, I the next best thing was to be a play-by-play -play broadcaster, and that was my dream. And I majored in communications at Temple, and then I served as a naval public affairs officer. And when I came out, I started at the little station in Pottstown, then up to BCB in Levittown, of which, as you know, I am now managing partner. Mm -hmm. And then I came into the city at WWDB. I was one of 94 people to audition for summer replacement for Charlie Swift and kept getting called back and called back and called back and ultimately hired, uh, went in to do the sports on the first day and was scared to death because my, the guy we listened to was a guy by the name of Ken Garland. He was the biggest disc jockey in the city. He had, he had the highest, the highest ratings any place. And, and I knew he was going to be down the hall. I had never met him, but he was in another studio down the hall, and I had to lead into him, and I didn't know what he would think. So anyhow, at five after six on a Monday morning, I belt out the sports, and I'm scared to death, and then I read the card and say, and I said, time now for the start of the Ken Garland show. And I don't hear anything. And I think, oh, my gosh, I must have clicked the station off the air. 
and it was the longest three seconds of my life. <laughs> he came on, and he said his opening words were, well, if I were Charlie Swift, I would hurry home from vacation. And before I left the building that morning, they signed me to do the pre- and post-game shows and the Ed Kayat show, who was then the coach of the Eagles. Wow. So that's, that's how it all began. But when I ultimately got the Eagles job, five or six years later through unbelievable circumstances, uh, I, that to me was the ultimate. I've never wanted to be anything else. Um, I have had offers over the years to go up to the networks, both Fox and CBS. Um, it didn't really appeal to me as much as doing the Eagles games. And plus, I mean, we always do things if we can better our, our position in life and all the other considerations. And each time WIP was there, to say we want you to stay and make it worth it for me to stay and but i didn't really want to leave this to me to do the eagles games that i mean i i was an eagles i was born an eagles fan and to do the games that i that i grew up with the team i grew up loving to me this is the ultimate and to travel instead of traveling on thursdays and getting home on mondays and doing it 20 times a season i travel 10 12 times a year that's it and I have my radio station up here in Levittown. That's where I am right now. Work with a lot of wonderful young people and um, have a great family life with my wife and two kids So I'm, and two grandchildren. So I and play all the golf I want. So there's nothing I want more. Merrill, I, you, you kind of glossed over it, but I, I, not to get into the, to all the nitty gritty, but it was a it was very difficult trying circumstances when you took over yeah. the Eagles yeah. gig. And you, you got it on very short notice, too. Can, can you just kind of walk us through how you were sort of thrown into the fire there? Okay, I, I'm going to go back a couple steps, Rob. Yeah. Um, I did the pre- and post-game shows. Uh, <clears throat> I had been doing them for about three or four years. And uh, before the last game of the 75 season, Al Pollard, who was a former Eagles fullback, did the color for mm -hmm. Charlie Swift. All I did was the pre- and post-game shows. I was locked in the studio, never went to the game. And uh, the the Saturday before the last game or the next to the last game of the 75 season, uh, I I get a call Saturday afternoon, and it was Ed Kayet, who was the former coach of the Eagles, and he was back as the defensive line coach of the Lions, mm -hmm. who the Eagles were playing the next day. And he said, why don't you come over to the Marriott where we're staying and have dinner? And I said, I'd like nothing more. So I went to the Marriott that night and I had dinner with Ed Kayat. And he's telling me all about the Lions and all about this one, and all about that one. I said, this is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And after a long dinner, I'm driving home. And I was single at the time, lived in an apartment in media. And I'm driving home. And I'm thinking to myself, boy, this is amazing. I know all these things about the Lions, but I'm never going to have a chance to use them because all I'm doing is reading the lineups, going with the postgame show. Mm -hmm. That next morning, Dean Tyler, who was the program director of WIP, I'm getting ready to go to the studio, calls me and said, Al Pollard is sick. He cannot. He is absolutely sick. Mm -hmm. No, 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 no. Oh, Merrill, if you can hear me, hold on a second. We lost your audio. One, one second. One second, Merrill. Okay, if you can hear me, ha hang on. Uh, can you guys hear me, Derek and uh, Barrett? Yeah. Yeah. Right, Xander, Xander, try and get Merrill. Uh, just, just try and see if you can communicate with him because we I'm lost his. And needles, man. I know. I, I like right at the crescendo. <laughs> we were like right. right there at the finish. <laughs> uh, I don't know if uh, Xander, you might have to call him. Um, because I don't, I think he thinks we're still up. So I'll, uh, we'll try and get that straightened out. And then Xander, just give me the heads up when, when Merrill's good to, to, to come back. And if you want to just bring him up, that's fine. Uh, so we're just, we're straightening out as well. Unfortunately, you know, it, uh, we, we haven't perfected the, uh, all the technological stuff as of right. All right, Merrill, can you hear me? No, we, you're still muted, Merrill. If you can hear me, you're still muted. So I'm going to have, I, I got it. How about now? Yeah. All right. So let me, let me go, go back to, you got the call that Al Pollard was sick. Sick. Pick it up, th pick it up there. 
So, so I, he, he said, go directly to the stadium. You're doing color. Mm. And so I, I go to the stadium and, you know, I'm scared to death. Suddenly I'm in the seat next to Charlie Swift. I'm actually at the game, but I'm packed with all this information about the lions. And just before we go on, Dean Tyler's standing behind me. And he said, and he's never heard me do a game or anything like that. He turns to me and he said, he said, are you sure you're all right? <laughs> and I turned to Dean and I said, let me just get this straight. It's three for a field goal. <laughs> <laughs> one, one for an extra point for a safety yeah 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 so, so i go on and i do the game with charlie and nobody can imagine somebody here having all this information about the lions oh my so, god so it, it goes extremely well but by the next year but by, by the end of it it's it's over right and the next year i'm back doing the color and at the end of the 76 season Pollard, for whatever reason, retires from the broadcast mm -hmm. on his own. Mm -hmm. Retires. He's had enough running around. Maybe um, there were family decisions made, but he has. He's out of it. Right. And who do they pick to do? Usually, they're going to pick a Barrett Brooks. They're right, going to right. pick a former player. Instead, based on my one day of doing that game, Dean Taylor says you're doing the color next year, and wow. um, I went and did the color. So. I did the color. This is the 77th season. Now, Charlie Swift was a very professional broadcaster. I learned a lot just sitting next to him in the booth. He was technically as 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 perfect as you could possibly be. He he knew everything about the mechanics of play-by-play. -play. I had done play-by-play -play football in college. I had also done the pen games. But anyhow, I hadn't done a game in a long time. So I'm in the booth with him. We got along extremely well, but it was not like Mike Quick and I are really close personal friends. We go to each other's family affairs. We play golf together. We talk to each other five times during the week. It was it was a very healthy, good, <coughs> solid business relationship. And when we got home from the there were 14 games, then the 12th game was in Dallas and I got off the plane and Charlie said, see you next week, kid. He always called me kid. See you next week, kid. And I went home. And that Tuesday morning, I was still working at WWDB full time doing morning sports mm -hmm. on a kind of a morning zoo type show. Mm -hmm. And that and, and the disc jockey would call me at 430. I, I lived in my apartment and he'd wake me at 430 and I'd get up and go to the studio. Mm -hmm. And one day that Tuesday, December the 7th, the, the phone rang. And I looked at the clock and it was 2.30. Mm. And I said, this is weird. I picked up the phone and a guy said, Merle, it's Tim Early. And I'm trying to think, who's Tim Early? And then I remember Tim Early is a friend of Charlie Swift's. And he said, Charlie's dead. Oh. And I said, what? Charlie had taken his own life. Yeah. And uh, why remains a mystery to me. Mm -hmm. But uh, he had shot himself and, mm -hmm. and that was it. So I went into WWDB and I, I immediately from the first sportscast to the last did a eulogy uh, right. about Charlie Swift. I forgot all the other sports of the day. Mm -hmm. and, now, we didn't have cell phones then, <clears throat> but at nine o'clock or nine oh five, as soon as the station switchboard opened, the phone rang and I picked it up and it was Dean Tyler. And Dean Tyler said, you're doing game Sunday to get a color analyst. Now, WDB at the time was oh. uh, it had oh. become a talk station, but the but they are okay. It was part of a black rhythm and blues station, and the big okay. disc jockey on the rhythm and blues station was a guy by the name of Sonny Hap Hopson. And all of the big athletes in the city used to pop in and hang out with Sonny Hobson. And I became very good friends with some of them. I became friends with Richie Allen. When when he was AWOL from the Phillies, he used to check in with me every day. And uh, he, he we became great friends. And the other person who I became friendly with was a, a former All-Pro Green Bay Packer who went to the Hall of Fame. I And 
Herb Adderley is one of the Herb greatest Adderley. cornerbacks yep. in the history of football. Yep. Yeah, Herb Adderley. And I called but he lived in Philadelphia. So I called mm-hmm. Herb, and I got Herb to do the color for the last two games of the 77 season. And so uh, it went well, <laughs> but I had no guarantees. The next thing that happens, I go through the whole winter. And, and you know, by the end of the week, by the time that week was over – there were hundreds of tapes coming in from all over the country. Everyone wants that job. And I have no, I have no guarantees. So I'm having dreams all winter. One night I, I dream that WIP called me and told me they had the job. And I wake up and I'm depressed because I only dreamt it. And <laughs> another night I would dream that WIP told me they were going in another direction. And it turned out that, uh, I I woke up happy because they really weren't going in another direction. So this goes on for months and months and months. And we get into the following year and it's, I think it's, it's March. It's, it's late March. And, um, I, I was at the DB, they bought out, they were talking about the truck, which was the burlesque theater in town mm-hmm. was sold. And I said, what's the truck? I don't know. Mm-hmm. They said, when Moore was the host, he said, I'll tell you what, we're going to buy out the truck and invite all of our, our listeners, and we're going to put on a show there. So I do the show late at night, and uh, I, I sang A Pretty Girl is Like a Melody. We had to do all skits, burlesque skits, and, and we took the listeners out to a Chinese restaurant. I got home at 3 in the morning. I got up, went to WWDB. Now I'm I'm walking like a zombie Mm. because we have to go back and do another show on Friday night. Mm. And I'm in a deep sleep and the phone rings and it's Dean Tyler telling me, uh, Merle, uh, uh, you're the new voice of the Eagles. Congratulations. And he tells me I'm the sports director, WIP. And he tells me I'm I'm, I'm abrogated and I'm thrilled. Mm. So I hang up. And I go and do the show that night. And on Saturday, I call my program director and tell him that I'm leaving for WIP. And, you know, I'm sorry. You know, I'm, I, and he's thrilled for me. Mm-hmm. And everything's good. And, and WIP had told me to come in on Monday and sign a contract. And I'm driving down the expressway on Monday. And all of a sudden, I broke into this cold sweat. I'm thinking, what if I dreamt it? <laughs> <laughs> what if I dreamt it again? And I just gave notice. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. That that's how it happened, and I and and the but I'll tell you what I still think of that first game that I did after Charlie died. Right. That I stood up in that broadcast booth, and they said the Eagles had a moment of silence mm-hmm. for Charlie. Yeah. Mm. Oh. oh along the side yeah uh so merrill i think we we lost you for a second we'll uh we'll try and get that straightened out these stories are unbelievable i, I mean i knew i knew the charlie swift story i knew he took his own life and merrill was kind of just thrust in there but i didn't know the detail of, of all of it merrill, I mean, we got you back now that was incredible incredible do we have merrill I, yeah he's muted Oh, Merrill, we got you. Yeah, we're on. Can you hear us now? All right, we'll, we'll Xander. Let's see if we could. We'll, we'll give it one more college try. Unfortunately, we had a bad hookup there, but that was uh, boy. The, can, I, Merrill's got an unbelievable memory too. You, you know what I mean? Like that was wild. Yeah, hey, Merrill, you're you're muted too. There, there are people. There are people we worked with Rob at NBC for twenty years. Yeah, I couldn't tell you their names to save my life. Every day it would be, hey, how you doing? Yeah. I, when it comes to numbers, statistic, addresses, phone numbers, <clears throat> I can tell you 10 years ago where they are. But when it comes to names, yeah, I'm terrible. To the point, when I'm out with my wife, and if I see somebody who I know I know from somewhere, but I don't know their name, what I do is, hey, how you doing? This is my wife, Trish. And she'll say, hi, what's your name? She'll, she's my buffer. And then when she says the name, when they say the name, it clicks. But I am I am brutal with the names. This guy's- I hear you. Names from 40, 50. Well, here, he's back. We got you now, Merrill. So, uh, but you, you, you hear me? 
Yeah, so you were right at the point of the very first game when you took over for Charlie and just, you know, how difficult that must have been oh. and the tributes and everything that was going on. Yeah. And, and they're looking up there, and I'm just saying, let something come out of my mouth. Right. And I'll tell you about the game. The, the Eagles beat the Giants, and Ron Jaworski scored the winning touchdown on a naked boot, and it was the first touchdown on a kickoff return in the career of Wilbert Montgomery. Oh, wow. wow. That wow. is awesome. How about that? That's a pretty good first game. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I got to do every foot every touchdown in his career because when he left here, he left and went to the Lions yep. at the deal for Gary Cobb, and right. he never scored again. Is that right? He never wow. scored as a Lion. I knew I knew he was traded for G. That, Cobb. That's that's fascinating, Merle. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what is the well, yeah. So, I, I, look, I'll, I'm gonna, I'm gonna leap way forward up to Super Bowl Fifty Two here for a second, and I'm sure there's a lot in between that we'll, we'll, we'll dive into. But give me your sense that day when you woke up in your hotel room in Minnesota, because I had an eerie sense that the Eagles were winning this game, despite the fact that they had a backup quarterback, despite the fact that it was the Patriots and Tom Brady and all that. What was your sense when you woke up that day? I just had this, this feeling come over me as a Philadelphia. But how did you feel when you woke up? Nervous. But you see, you have to realize that I'm nervous every game, whether it's a preseason game or a regular season game or a playoff game or a Super Bowl. I wake up on a game day and I'm absolutely nervous. Hmm. I can't eat after I leave the house or leave the hotel. I can't even look at food until I go on the air and it all goes away. But I feel that nervousness. I'm not thinking about winning or losing on the day of a game. But something happened the day before. I was in the hotel lobby. And all of a sudden, in the hotel, somebody picks me up from behind and lifts me in the air. And I'm saying, put me down. And I turn around, and it's LeGarrette Blunt who wow. I had actually become very friendly with, with all that, that toughness that he exudes. He was one of the nicest, warmest people I've ever met. And he looks at my ring, which I'm proudly wearing, and it was the 2004 NFC Championship ring. Right, right. And, I'm, I'm, and he said, let me look at that ring. And he said, that is a loser's ring. Oh. I said, it's all I have. He <laughs> said, he said, we're going to get you a real ring tomorrow. Wow. Wow. I promise you're going to get a real ring tomorrow. And so now I'm feeling, you know, and I'm seeing the guys and they're all feeling great about this thing. But when I woke up that day, I was, I'm, I'm nervous about a million things. Do I have all the numbers down? Do I have the right setup? And, and during the week, Paul Domwich interviewed me for a story and he said, if the Eagles win, are you going to have something prepared that you're going to say? And some broadcasters, these mm -hmm. big moments, do jot down notes or sentences or paragraphs or whatever. And I said, no. I said, after all these years, I'm just going to let whatever comes out, come out. Mm -hmm. And we go to the game. And um, the, you guys have to know this. Radio, radio booths have become worse over the years, the newer the stadium, the worse the broadcast booth for the most part. And in that, at that game, uh, people often say to me, was I nervous before the last play of the game where the Eagles are up by eight points and Brady's going to have one more shot at the end zone? And the answer is, I was scared to death. <laughs> but I was scared to death. Not that the Eagles were going to lose. Because number one, I didn't think Brady had that kind of arm. If it were Aaron Rodgers throwing that Hail Mary, I'd be more nervous. But we're sitting in a corner of the end zone, the far end zone. I am 110 yards away from where that ball is going to come down. And all I'm thinking is I don't want to be known as the broadcaster who blew the end of the Super Bowl. <laughs> so, so he goes back and he stumbles and he lets it go. And I, I'm going to tell you this, and it's going to sound crazy. But as that ball went through the air, suddenly it turned into, for my eyes or my brain, it turned into NFL films where everything slowed down. And it seemed like it took forever to come out of the air. And then it was bounced around. And then it hit the ground. 
And I looked up at the clock and I saw zeros. And all I could say was, it's incomplete. The game is over. The Philadelphia Eagles are Super Bowl champions. And then all I could think of saying is, Eagles fans everywhere, this is for you. Let the celebration begin. Yeah. But but that that's all I could think of at that moment. I just I just didn't want to blow the last call. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a great call. Go ahead, Tyre. Merrill, what is it about what you do for so long that you enjoy the most? You know, it there's so many things, uh, Derek, and, and you, you know, I I think you're gonna say the same thing and and you guys are going to feel what I what I enjoy the most. Two days ago, three days ago, I saw Barrett. We were playing at Doc, Brian Dawkins golf tournament, and to come out there and see to 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 see Barrett and to see Trot on the driving range, and Brian Westbrook came up, and Seth Joyner was in, and Trent Cole was there. I mean, Jaworski came. They were all there to to be around the people to get. To have the feeling, I mean, I've heard players say the, the thing they miss the most is that locker room. I mean, I've I've heard I've heard Jason Kelsey say he he the the thing that keeps having him come back is to be around the guys and to, to have that kind of camaraderie. Yep, that feeling of getting to know these people. Now, truly, I love the game. I love the opportunity to they you know. Let's not say this too loud, or WIP will get an idea. <laughs> but but the truth of the matter is, all of us would do these games for free. Yes, <laughs> but, but we earn our money Monday through Saturday, preparing and memorizing and looking at game tape and talking to people. That's where we make it. Game day. Oh my gosh, there's nothing better than the feeling of that nervousness going to the game, being up in the booth, yep. describing it. It's there's there's nothing quite like it, hmm. but that all the friends that I've made over the years, where I can still talk to Stan Walters, I went to visit him. My son was, uh, as he was a film editor, was shooting a film in Atlanta, and Cindy and I went and stayed with the Walters for a few days this year, uh, this this past February, and and the the feeling you can pick up these the phone all the time and and hear from the same guy the guys, my. My relationship with Dick Vermeil mm. is closer than it ever was when he was a coach who was so intense every single moment. You know, the the, the stories I've had about Buddy Ryan, where mm-hmm. I got to know Buddy Ryan and got to love Buddy Ryan. <laughs> and the, these coaches have been wonderful over the years. There's only one coach in all of these 45 years. There's only one coach I could tell you that I didn't feel this, you know, feel good about. And, and that was Chip Kelly. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. you could go up to Chip Kelly. I, I mean, I, I got, they had a fantastic, his last year, they had a great Thanksgiving game in Dallas. Mark Sanchez quarterback, mm-hmm. they beat the Cowboys. They were rolling along and I got onto the plane and I walked down the aisle, and Chip Kelly was right there on the aisle. And I just turned to him and I said, Coach, that was a thrill to broadcast. You guys did a great job. And he looked over at me, looked over at me and just said, oh, and turned away. You, and I had coaches come up to me on his staff and say to me, do you think I did anything wrong? He's not talking to me. Mm. He, you know, I think, I think what makes a great coach is the same thing that makes a great coach achiever in any sport and not only just sports but in any field whether it's business whether it's education whether it's broadcasting whether it's it, it, no matter what it is the exceptional people are great communicators they're people people they're people person mm-hmm. who can communicate with other people yep. he was the poorest communicator i've ever been around he did not get through to his players he made so many mistakes he lost that team yeah, they won for a while because he brought in this new scheme and that all was good for a year or so. But he, his players had no feeling for him. And let me tell you something. They, if You can say what you want about Buddy Ryan being tough and sarcastic, but if Buddy Ryan got up at 3.35 a.m. and <clears throat> put on one left sock and walked out of the hotel, 43 guys would have put on one left sock 
mm-hmm. and followed him out of that hotel. That's the kind of allegiance he had. That's the kind of love that, you know, Dick Vermeil's players to this day, and he was tough on them, but Dick Vermeil's players to this day love him. He was really special. Mm. Larry, let me let me ask you. Super Bowl, and obviously, that's got to be the pinnacle. Take take that one away for a minute. Maybe just go regular season. I, I got it. Got it. Okay, go ahead. December nineteenth, two thousand and ten. Yes. Giant Stadium. Yes. Eagles, yes. Eagles, Eagles so bad in the first half that I said on the air, I said the score is the Giants twenty three. The Eagles are still at their hotel. <laughs> 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 and they come back, and Michael Vick hits Fred Selleck for what turns out to be a 64-yard touchdown pass. And I said, oh, well, there's a score. And then David Akers, onside kick, recovered by Riley Cooper, which was probably the only good thing he ever did in his life. <laughs> they, they, they start marching down again, and then they score a touchdown pass to Macklin. Then they come right. marching down again. Mike, I still say that that's the best 30, 30 minutes of quarterbacking I've ever seen. He was That's brilliant. That's the best two yeah. quarters of quarterbacking I've ever seen, mm-hmm. Michael Vick that day. And then he scores on a quarterback draw, and then they, they do it again, and they score a touchdown pass to Jeremy Macklin inside the left pylon. And now you know they've got to hold the Giants one more time, and they do, and they do, and they <laughs> stop them, and the Giants punter, goes back and Mitch <laughs> punts the, and, and Mike Quick says to me, Merrill, he said, there is no way they are punting to Deshaun Jackson. Mm-hmm. And um, he punts the football and, and, and Deshaun looks up and he muffs the ball, mm-hmm. which throws off the entire timing of the coverage. And he picks it up and he starts to run and the Red Sea parts <laughs> and there's a hellacious block downfield by Jason Avance. Yep. And of course, the rest is history. Now, you know what? You guys have seen that played over and over again. Watch when he comes to the one yard line and Deshaun starts to pirouette and do a dance. There is a giant coming behind on him. Yes. And all I'm thinking and saying is get into the end zone. I don't care if you dance, dive, jump, anything. Mm-hmm. And he just makes it. But you know what? Every time I watch the replay of that, I'm scared that he's going to tackle him on the one. <laughs> I'm with you. A hundred, you, Merrill, you're, you're exactly right. There's a guy coming out of the end zone, yeah. and Deshaun's not in yet, and his back's turned to him. And I'm saying, oh, my God. I, I was doing the post-game show with Ike Reese, and we're at a remote, yeah. and we're losing our mind. Get in. Just get in. And yeah. then when he scored, we went sprinting from the back of the restaurant through the bar out to the front on, on the sidewalk in, in, in University City, and the whole bar is going bananas. It was unbelievable. I've never seen anything like that. And you know, I did Herman's Miracle of the Meadowlands back on November nineteenth. Westbrooks, you did Westbrooks. You've done them all. I did Westbrooks, sure. Yeah. But that 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 game, that whole game, that was the best. In right. fact, WIP played the game in its entirety the next morning. Again, is that right? Yeah, they ran that- it from like ten to noon. Oh my God! Hey, hey Merrill, God. Merrill, what do you think about this current roster? You know what, Derek? I can't believe this current roster. I think it's that good. Now, I have to tell you, I'm a Jalen Hurts fan. Yeah. I, I believe the Jalen Hurts. You see, people judge Jalen Hurts, and they they say, "Well, he he doesn't make the decisions fast enough. He doesn't do." First of all, he's got his arm strength is underrated by a lot of people. He's got plenty of arm. There's not a throw that he cannot make. I mean, does he have Josh Allen's arm strength, pure arm strength? No, but he's got he's got plenty of arm strength, and there he's he, he's perfect. He's fine there. But but they're judging they they look at him. Do you remember Josh Allen in his first year with Buffalo? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Two years all over the lot. Yep. Now now we look. Now I'm not telling you that Jalen Hurts is going to become Aaron Rodgers, but. Aaron Rodgers was drafted by Green Bay in 2005. He sat on the bench in 2005, 2006, 2007. He didn't go full-time as their starter in 2008. And yep. he may be, you know, one of the greatest ever. You look at Drew Brees. Three years from now, Drew Brees will be 
unanimously elected into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Drew Brees was just okay in San Diego, or they wouldn't have drafted Phillip Rivers and let him go. They didn't even get anything from him. Miami didn't sign him because of his injury, because of his shoulder. And then New Orleans took a, a chance at him. Sean Payton coached the heck out of him, and he became one of the all-time greats and a Super Bowl champion. I, I just think it's way too early to to evaluate at, at, at a long range with Jalen Hurts. But I know this. The guys on the team love him. They will yep. follow him to the end of the earth. He's got the intelligence. He's got the work ethic. He's got the athleticism. I think he's and, – and here's the other thing, and I say kudos to the Eagles because they have put him in front of a stable of offensive talent. He's yep. got as good an offensive line as there is in the NFL. The receiving core is loaded. The tight end position is fine, and the backs are – better than just okay. Mm-hmm. So I I think I and, and listen, and listen what they've done to the defense. I mean Bradbury coming in the other day. And why did he come in? Uh sure there's money involved, but he said one of the determining factors was the fact that this defensive line is going to be so good. And the defensive line is a cornerback's best friend. So you and, and in the draft when you can take the two guys from Georgia, the two biggest impact defensive players on the national championship team, Davis and Dean, boy, you've you've just picked up a load. Yep. I just think they've done a great job in player position this year. I think this team is in great shape. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm going to tell you the truth. Ahead, I'm going to tell you, Mary, I, I, you know, I, I can't interview. I can't <coughs> ask you any questions, you know, because – just got too much respect for you, man. And every time I just sit back and awe at you, man. So <laughs> I'll let these guys do the interview, man. You know, I just uh, well, I'll, you. I'll ask one, Merrill. And this is uh, we, we were talking about this right before you came on. Some people just have that voice, just have that sort of presence. And some people, they it's for the air. And when you talk to me off there, it's like, hey, how are you? You know, and it's a completely different story. <laughs> you sound exactly you have. When did. I guess the question is when you hit puberty, man, did this thing just kick in? Like what, when did you know you had that voice? I, I, I think it was between my first and second year of college okay. where over the summer I was kind of hoarse half the time or whatever <laughs> cracking. Yeah. And then by the time I was a sophomore, the, the voice had matured. You know, it was okay. nothing that you do, but it, it, your voice is a voice. That's all. Yeah, hey, man, how many people have asked you to do their voice? Or their phones, their answering service. Well, uh, I do that, Derek. I do it. I do it for charities, uh, where a charity will say, "Can you donate that?" And what I will do is, I I do a recording for for a charity auction, and in that recording, I go Jalen Hurts lines them up out to the far side, goes to Vontae Smith to the near side, goes Derek Gunn. Back goes Hurts. He's looking deep. He's got Gunn at the 15, the 10, the 5. Derek Gunn is gone. But he'll, call you back. he'll call you back just as soon as he returns. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> that is awesome, man. Oh, Merrill, listen, we can't wait till this year. We can't, I, 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 we talk about every day, and we'll be breaking down the Eagles when, when we say goodbye to you. We, but what they've done over this offseason has just put people over the moon. They are very excited about this, this current group, man. That's for sure. And, your stories today, I, I learned st- – I thought I knew everything about Merrill Reese. I learned things I did not know, man. This was great. Thank you very much for taking this much time with us. Hey, it's, it's always great to be with you guys. You do a great job. And, uh, D, I, you, you should be stationed outside the locker room after every game because the players love to talk to you and they open up to you. And, Barrett, you should be doing the biggest games as a color analyst because you're not only a guy who played the game – you are a student of the game. Thank and you. You learn to communicate well. And Rob, everything you've ever done, you've done well. Thank so you. believe me, it's a pleasure to be on with all three of you. I appreciate Merle, you're the, it, man. You, are, you are a treasure to this city. I can tell you that. And we do appreciate a couple minutes. And thank you. Enjoy your weekend. And hopefully we'll get a chance to talk to you soon, Merrill. Thanks a lot. Look forward to it. Bye bye. Thank you. Take Merle. care. That was incredible. Come Derek, on. Derek, great job getting Merrill, man. But that was that flat out incredible. I mean, I couldn't interview him. I, I mean, I can't. I got so much respect for him, and he's done so much for me. I just, I just, I just didn't feel 
you know, I, it didn't feel appropriate for me. I, I've never interviewed him. I talk to him all the time. When I talk to him, it's more so as a as a um, a, a figurehead person in my life that you know pushed me in the right direction, man. So. I love that. I love that he did that, Barrett. I, I I said that before he came on. I think that is so cool because he didn't have to do that. He could do right. you know, but most people, Derek, you you know this. Most people in the business view anybody else as a threat, right? right? I'm not saying you know Barrett was going to become the play by play guy for the. I'm just saying like people in the business in general are kind of always looking over their shoulder, like you, yeah, who's this guy? Who's this new? Right, and right, I, right, and, and, right, right. So that's that's really cool. It tells you about Merrill's character. It tells yep. you what kind of guy he is. Hey, hey Rob, when was the last time Barrett admitted somebody left him speechless? This would be the first. <laughs> I, mar- I actually marked it down. It's uh, May twentieth. No, I I don't recall ever. So so now my my goal is to find more guests that <laughs> speechless, speechless on this show. We uh, yeah bro. we're gonna be like Derek. Who do you, who do you have today? Well, I I'm not really worried about what's happening in sports. I'm trying to get somebody who's gonna just you know exactly. uh, make make Barrett speechless. I, I took notes, guys, and 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 one of the better notes that I took. Was the fact that you know the guy that you know that passed away, but he said if the relationship between him and him, he said it was healthy and productive relationship, man. So we need to keep a healthy and productive relationship, okay? See that, Derek? <laughs> See that? Yeah. What? But he, they said they weren't friends. They weren't really friends, and they hang out or anything. But, but, but I mean, think about this, and, and I don't want to be maudlin, but. You know, the, the dude, the guy, the Charlie Swift was his name. I don't want to say the guy. Char, and I mean this respectfully. Sadly, takes his own life. Merrill, like, days later is thrown into the booth as the play-by-play guy without very little, you know, time to even – maybe you're better off not thinking about it too much. But that is crazy circumstances. It is. It is. It is. It really you know, is. Sometimes you perform better when you have a little amount of time to prepare for it. Yeah. You know, there's some people, in, and we're all guilty of this, you can pre- prepare and prepare days, weeks – and then when you actually do it, you come away saying that didn't feel right. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Sometimes doing stuff on the fly is much better, much more spontaneous than it is long term preparation. No doubt. No doubt. And that was great. And again, if you missed any of it, you can always go back. Uh, Apple, Spotify, listen to the podcast, go back on our, our Jacob Sports YouTube channel and watch it in its entirety. It was that was great, man. That was great. All right. Let- 